now we come to a story that 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 I've missed and I think I've missed because I've been a bit distracted this month for some reason I don't know why um but this this is some research that that in part has come out of uh Newcastle University uh, university that I'm familiar with and occasionally occasionally lecture at uh and it's it's a headline actually specifically that I know um Chiara one of our uh, admins and a blog contributor at, at ArcuSoup was very excited about because of the uh, the headline uh, on uh, sciencemag.org which said sword wielding scientists show how ancient fighting <laughs> techniques spread across uh, a bronze age Europe and I think she quite liked the idea of people ah! just like running through a lab or something and um, smashing things but this this is actually a very interesting bit of research and, and initially I, I i was curious as to what what specifically was being said that was worthwhile reflecting upon but actually looking into it it looks as though uh this is answering a specific use where question as to as to how and why and when bronze age warriors used weapons opinions on bronze vary wildly i remember seeing um uh and when also, frankly, uh, experimental archaeology varies wildly. I remember seeing a, a a demonstration, I think, on a TV show. It might even have been Time Team. I'm not sure about that, though. Uh, where um, uh, the question was being asked, uh, why is it that the, the iron came to be used in weaponry? Why did the Iron Age occur? And someone said, well, because iron's just superior. Observe. And they spent the time forging early Iron Age uh, equivalent material and late Bronze Age equivalent material. And uh, when they came to test the two metals, actually bronze, late Bronze Age metal was superior to early Iron Age metal, much to the surprise of some of the people involved in the experiment. Um, and in that sense, the, the 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 use of these metals and the ex expertise in creating artifacts and shields and jewellery even from these metals has always been a point of interest, specifically in terms of, uh, in terms of how how I suppose what's the what's the um uh what's the optim the optimal way of using it, and so when it comes to bronze weapons um it, on the other end of the scale, so bronze on bronze, people were uh, have been debating whether or not actually some bronze weapons were simply ornamental they'd be hung on a wall or something or maybe put on the side of a chariot for display uh, and and instead older forms of combat would be used even actually in the bronze age people were still using for example stone arrowheads uh, you know and this kind of thing um but actually this uh, this 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 piece of research it looks as though what they've done is they've done some sword on sword contact experiments to see whether or not use wear and the nicks and dings and bashes that, that we see on uh, other weapons compare with Bronze Age swords that we find in the archaeological record so so that we can understand whether or not actually uh, as some people suggest maybe a, warriors would avoid smacking the swords against each other just in case they bent or or shattered or something um, uh, I mean, you you seem you seemed particularly interested in this story. I mean, what 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 did you take away from it? What I liked about it was that it's a piece of long-term experimental research trying mm. to make uh, an aspect of the past about which, as you said, there's been a lot of speculation and a lot of assumptions have been made, mm. and a lot of wishful thinking actually has gone on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but it, it's taking taking that context, creating a physicality as accurately as it's possible to do with modern materials and so on. Mm. And then, uh, so as well as creating a physical artifact, instead of archaeologists, as you say, running through a lab trying to bash seven shades out of each other, <laughs> uh, which would be great fun, but academically probably wouldn't be that, no, would, you know, wouldn't no. pass peer review. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, what they've done is go to fencing experts who study uh, ancient and uh, medieval and Renaissance fencing manuals to look at fighting styles and how swords have been used down the ages mm. by people in combat in, in duels, but principally in duels, one-on-one mm. -on -one heroic, uh, a one-on-one -on -one heroic masculine uh, activities it's often presented. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and they've come up with a methodology, they've come up with uh, a series of experiments, and then they've done comparators with 
as you say, material from the archaeological archive, which suggests that maybe they're, they're on the right lines in terms of how, this, how these artefacts were actually used in the Bronze Age. Mm. Great piece of academic research, as far as I'm mm. concerned, about a, a subject about which, as I say, too many assumptions have been made. And I think often uh, we've seen it about the Neolithic as well. Um, I, I remember um, when I first started, was, was taking my archaeological qualifications, started taking my archaeological qualifications in the early 90s, uh, reading, uh, well, I was doing a module on, on prehistory and reading completely diametrically opposite views of the British Neolithic. One, it was a past, uh, you know, largely pastoral, egalitarian um, society with very little conflict. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, little, because the, the population was, uh, it was argued that, you know, uh, it, was it was largely agrarian, the population wasn't that large, so therefore there was plenty of space and therefore little reason to challenge mm -hmm. anyone for space and resources and so on and so on and so on. And then you get sites like, the gate at, I think it's Crickley Hill, which is absolutely peppered with stone arrowheads as though it's been attacked. Yeah, yeah. Um, and also, you, mean, you, do, you do see some, so, some near the thick battle sites as well. Uh, not, you know, where, where indeed, people we, and we, show injuries. We, we, and, yeah. mm. So go on. Indeed, 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 indeed. And, 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 and other, other, you know, equally authoritative authors were taking exactly that view, that it was a very different mm. kind of society. And my underlying reason for being fascinated by this period and fascinated by this article is that um, one of, well, the first novel by, sorry, the second novel actually by Rosemary Sutcliffe, Eagle of the Night was the first. The second novel by Rosemary Sutcliffe, which I read as a teenager and absolutely loved, and it's one, again, another one of the things that got me into history and archaeology, mm -hmm. um, was a book called Warrior Scala, which is set on the South Downs of, uh, of, of England. Um, and in her note, uh, Rosemary Sutcliffe, uh, author's note, Rosemary Sutcliffe um, suggested that for her, she wanted to write about the Bronze Age because although there was no British Iliad, it was a, it, it, it was a British heroic age. It was a heroic society. It was these sword carrying warriors mm, mm. Um, with their retinues that we saw with names like Achilles and Hector mm -hmm, mm. and Odysseus in, 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 in the Iliad. And that struck me as a reasonable view to take. Mm. And she created a world where um, this kind of thing is the routine. Um, I So I, I've got a slightly sort of romantic way of coming at it. But as I say, I think it's a, it's a, it's a piece of very smart, thought through, structured academic research about something which is, as you said at the beginning, a lot of assumptions have been made. We've now got something a little bit more, uh, concrete's the wrong word, but um, a little more solid to go on, I think. So terrific piece of work, very evocative piece of work, raises a lot of questions about culture, kind of things we're not going to be able to answer because we haven't got a British Iliad, as, you know, as, mm. as, as people said back in the 1950s. But well, 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 fascinating piece of work, I think. Certainly, yeah, and actually, it, well, uh, uh, I'll come to the conclusions of the study in a second, but uh, they remind me a little bit of um, uh, stuff that people like Tolkien used to uh, to sort of lament was the fact that the the uh, the Norman conquest more or less eradicated whatever was left over from previous British storytelling traditions, and then really what we ended up with was was either stuff that was kept on the fringes, so the you know, Beowulf survived, and you know, the sagas, for example, survived in other places in Northern Europe, um, and, and older stories uh, possibly survived as nursery rhymes. For example, some research has been shown, uh, suggested that things like Little Red Riding Hood might be a, a really, really old story, um, or based on a really, really old story. Uh, but ultimately, the, 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 the storytelling culture and traditions and maybe some of the things that could have been, because you know, the Iliad obviously was, of course, you know this, but was passed down orally, essentially. It wasn't written down you know, until thousands of years later. You know. well, cl um, I mean, cl 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 closer, to, closer to home, we've got the um, uh, the, tain, the the Toyn, the, the, the cattle raider Cooley in, in, in Irish mythology, yeah. which people argue about when that dates on. appears to have been written down in the Middle Ages, but they argue... Uh, uh, Till the cows come home about when it where the origins goes. come from yeah no uh, and the thing is that obviously where the origin think, is well and it's also i suppose the map Mabinogion is similar as well although that was written down indeed later absolutely. than that as yes. well um 
in terms of the, yeah. but but so sorry, the, the the point is sorry is, is that uh, yes, uh, undoubtedly we've lost the connection with some of that, some of those those stories which have been preserved in 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 the uh, in the Mediterranean a bit more solidly. Uh, but the study itself, actually, um, uh, Dr. Dolfini. Who, who, who I really want to, to interview. I keep on trying to chase him down, but he's a very busy man. Um, he said, people understood that these weapons could be very easily marked and so sought to use them in ways that would limit the amount of damage that they received. But, it is likely that these specialized techniques yes. would have been uh, learned from someone with more experience and would have required a certain amount of training to be mastered. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, for, for reference, actually, there's a wonderful um, specialist at the moment in terms of medieval combat who essentially has looked at sword manuals and he lives as an itinerant knight more or less doesn't he um and uh, and it's, it's almost like watching someone doing a martial art well in that sense it is a martial art but but what, what we might think of as much more finely there tuned are, there, are, there are now martial arts clubs that studying medieval and renaissance fencing yeah yeah and it, it starts off in theater uh, yes. with actors doing it um for um, productions like romeo and juliet and so on mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and hamlet where you've got dueling and um it's now become a sport in its own right yes. it'll be a niche one but it's it, it's out there mm -hmm, mm -hmm. obviously I, i'm coming to this from a certain possibly a, a different level of knowledge about military affairs and weapons than many archaeologists would have because one of my specialisms is the archaeology of conflict mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it is and one of the first things you learn when you're studying uh, conflict in terms of not about morality or anything like that, just in terms of sheer um, the physical process of people fighting each other mm -hmm. is that the style adapts to the technology available. And the most obvious thing at the moment, for example, is the use of IEDs in places like Afghanistan, mm -hmm. what's called asymmetric warfare, where you have extremely high tech, very capable Western Western armies and, and, and troops equipped in Western fashion who are basically tied down and um, driven to pay a very heavy physical and political price by uh, effectively homemade weapons. Mm. Mm. And you know, in, in the 18th century, for example, one of the reasons you had set piece battles with lines of troops standing 100 meters away from each other and firing volleys and musket fire was that was the only way to make those weapons effective mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, an individual musket can't be fired like a rifle it's not that accurate no. it's the mass effect that that, that makes the that, that, that makes the tactic work so you know you, you have to be aware of this for any period in history and um and, and i think what, what's what's clever about this is, is that, that you know they've they've taken that on board and they've looked at said okay you know if you were going to use these things as weapons how would you use them and what and what analogs have we got and uh, how does this check against the evidence from the archaeological record and it ticks all those boxes so terrific piece of work mm.